shift. What is the single best lifestyle shift that someone can do right now to positively, you know, affect their lifetime cancer risk? So every year in the U.S., about 2 million Americans are diagnosed with cancer. And the American Cancer Society estimates that about 40% of those cancers could be prevented if everybody followed sort of the optimal lifestyle uh, um, uh, suggestions that they make. So we could reduce those 2 million diagnoses every year to about 1.2 million. So they're not all preventable, but we could certainly prevent a bunch of them. So number one on the list, I'm sure everyone will know, is smoking. That's the biggest risk factor for cancer, and it's the one that many of the public health people have focused on for many years, reducing cancer rates, making great gains in cancer, uh, reductions in cancer rates because of reductions in smoking. Uh, assuming you're not smoking, which is 80 to 85 percent uh, of the American population, obesity is actually the second on the list of risk factors for developing cancer. Unfortunately, Obesity is going in the other direction. As smoking rates go down, obesity rates are going up. So we're starting to see more obesity-related cancers. Uh, assuming you're not smoking and you're not obese, next on the list is actually alcohol consumption. You might have heard of the Surgeon General's warning recently about the link between alcohol and cancer that many people are not aware of. So there's a lot of alcohol-related cancers as well. After those sort of big three lifestyle changes, yes, exercise and diet are important. And exercise has been shown to reduce the risk of, you know, maybe eight to 10 of those cancers. There's over 100 different types of cancer. So it's a, it's a very complicated disease, all different cancer types. But we now have evidence suggesting that exercise will lower the risk of getting some of those cancers, particularly colon cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and several other cancers as well, such as stomach cancer, uh, esophageal cancer, and a few others. So yes, some evidence that these lifestyle chances really can reduce your risk of getting cancer. If, if someone had limited time and resources in the sort of 80-20 sense, so if you were going to put in 20% of your effort to kind of get 80% of the reward, do you think that, you know, what are some of the prevention strategies that would give you the biggest bang for your buck? Like, cancer screenings, exercise, things like that. So for sure, if you're a smoker, that's absolutely the best thing you can do is quit smoking. And you can really substantially reduce your risk by quitting smoking. And, and it has um, fairly quick benefits in terms of lowering uh, cancer rates. If you're obese, then yes, going on a weight loss program and reducing obesity would be the biggest thing. If you're a heavy drinker, then that's going to be a key thing. Assuming you're none of the above, you're not particularly overweight or smoking or uh, drinking heavily, then I think exercise really is next on the list. Um, and, you know, the general recommendation uh, is the public health guidelines of about 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise. Some evidence has suggested muscular strength training can lower the risk of some of these cancers as well, but most of the recommendations are really around sort of um, moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. I know, I know um, the major area of focus of your research is looking at how exercise affects cancer treatment, but I, I, there are some interesting questions I have with prevention as well. You're mentioning obesity being a big risk factor for, for a, a variety of different obesity-related cancers, and perhaps there's people that have genetic predispositions. Um, maybe they have, you know, some of these BRCA1, BRCA2 um, single nucleotide polymorphisms that may increase the risk of breast cancer, for example. Um, is there any evidence or do you have any opinions on whether someone that may have those risk factors, if they're, if they incorporate, you know, exercise into their, their personal hygiene, is that um, something that can help negate some of that cancer risk, even if they still have the genetic predisposition or even are obese, for example? Yeah, there is good evidence on that. So one of the mechanisms how exercise might lower the risk is through managing obesity. 
But what we also see is exercise lowers the risk of cancer regardless of your obesity status. So we can do the subgroup analysis of those who are BMI above 30, overweight, calorie, healthy weight. All of them show a reduction. So obesity is not the only mechanism by which exercise um, is lowering the risk. So even if you're obese and you don't lose weight, exercise can help you lower the risk of developing cancer. We even see this with smokers. So we can break them into sort of the smokers and the non-smokers with lung ca cancer risk. And even those who are smoking, exercise will help them lower the risk. Of course, that's small compared to the impact of not smoking. But it shows that exercise works within these groups to lower the risk. Whatever is kind of driving your risk, whether it's obesity, whether it's smoking, you can benefit from it. The, the genetic um, stuff, we haven't seen quite as much evidence yet. Um, you know, the, the BRCA genes you talked about there, it's like an 80% chance of getting breast cancer and very high with ovarian and some of these other ones. So you're almost on a kind of genetic trajectory that would be very hard to stop, you know, with a lifestyle change. So I haven't seen as much evidence there suggesting that it can be beneficial for those patients. There's other options for those patients in trying to reduce their risk. Yeah, that was probably the most extreme genetic uh, predisposition case. Yeah. I mean, there's other other um, genetic predispositions as well, or maybe a family history, if someone's got like, like a family history. And we've seen some of the studies look at that, trying to look at kind of, and just do it, as you say, by family history, a very simple way of looking at it. And we do find that exercise lowers the risk of developing some of these cancers, even in those who have a family history. There's... um. It, it seems like it's really just a panacea. I mean, in some regards, obviously, you know, if you're a smoker, you don't want the take home message to be I'm going to exercise, but still smoke, right? Like, no, like you should, you should quit smoking, right? That's like the number one thing. But, but the fact of the matter is, and, and we'll, I'd love to get into some of these mechanisms in a minute about how exercise is, you know, how it's playing a role in cancer prevention and, you know, affecting tumor biology through metabolic signals. I mean, glucose regulation being a big one, right? I mean, even if, if you're someone that who, who is obese and you're exercising and you're increasing glucose uptake into your muscle, I mean, that's, that's very beneficial to not have it then available for a lot of cancer cells, you know, which you know, pr primarily do use glucose for, for fuel. Um, so what about someone who is, let's say, not obese? They're healthy. Maybe they're in their 40s and they're someone that's more like a weekend warrior maybe. I don't even know if that would be the term. Maybe there's someone that just goes for a jog on the weekends only. Would there would there be a case to make for those people to maybe push a little bit higher intensity than just going for your your jog on the weekends in terms of like making a, an impact on their cancer prevention? Yeah. So what we see in the cancer prevention literature is there is a dose response association, as we say. So that means the more exercise you do, the greater the risk reduction. So even though we can kind of look at different cut points and say, here's kind of uh, a amount of exercise that will give you a, a benefit, we know that more is better. And there's various ways of getting that more. One of it, as you've pointed out, is increasing the intensity but also increasing the frequency or increasing their duration. And what you see with the exercise guidelines nowadays, if they've almost backed off any um, recommendations in terms of the frequency duration component, doesn't really matter how you slice and dice that exercise. So this guideline of 150 minutes per week, we used to say five days per week for 30 minutes. And then we used to say, okay, well, spread it out over at least three days and in minimum durations of 10 minutes. And now they're not even saying to spread it out over multiple days. And they're not even saying it needs to be a minimum of 10 minutes at once. So the whole weekend warrior thing, brought that, well, you can probably go on a Saturday and Sunday and do 50 minutes, you know, if you're out doing a, uh, a hiking or, or some other activity. And that might be just as beneficial as spreading it out over different days. Now, that's on the prevention side of things. Things get trickier, I think, on, on treatment side of things where maybe maybe more frequent bouts are important because you're looking at the acute effects of exercise, accumulating acute effects. But in terms of the general prevention strategy, the, the more you do, the better. And it doesn't really matter how you slice it up over the course of a week, as long as you get to that 150 minutes. Is there a limit on that? So we're saying 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, you know, depending on where you what journal you read for the definition of moderate intensity exercise, 
you'll find it's, you know, your your heart your heart rate max is going to like what, 70%, 75% heart rate max. Um, so I mean you're you're getting some sweat on your brow there. If you were to do, let's say, 300 minutes a week, you were to double that of moderate intensity, or you were gonna also increase the intensity, right? So you're doing more vigorous types of exercise. You're going above that 70, 75 percent. You're going to 80 percent max heart rate. Would you continue to see decreases in cancer risk? In that, I mean, is there is there a limit? Like, does it? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. So the general recommendation is actually 150 to 300 minutes. So you know, 150 we kind of use the minimum to getting these benefits, and then those benefits will continue to accrue up to about 300 minutes, and then the curves kind of plateau after that. You know, you can certainly do more than that, but in terms of bang for your buck and really getting the benefits, is getting up to that 150 minutes, and then further increases uh, as you get to 300 minutes. But it does kind of plateau after that. Okay. So really, it's better to be on the higher end of the recommendations, whether that's, you know, the moderate intensity exercise 300 minutes a week or vigorous intensity, the higher end being what, 150 minutes? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So it is viewed more as the minimum of achieving that. And all these guidelines note that further benefits can be gained by doing more. So we set that guideline around 150 and additionally getting up to 300 can be more. And generally, the guidelines just sort of double weight vigorous minutes. So when we say it can be 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous, you kind of get double credit for the vigorous intensity exercise or any combination of the two. It doesn't have to be all moderate or all vigorous. You can mix it up as well. But that's roughly uh, um, the extra benefit of the vigorous is this kind of double weighting that you're probably getting about twice the benefit as you might get with moderate intensity exercise. 